uh, organizers and ITAM for the opportunity to, to attend this workshop. It's been a lot of really great talks. And I'm just going to say a little bit about the work we're doing at uh, University of Nevada. I'm using AMO sensors to look for new physics, in particular axions and other new short-range kind of forces that have cosmological implications, which I think ties it in well with the overall scope of the workshop. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to split the talk and talk about two different uh, projects that we have. But sort of the overarching theme, or one of the themes in our lab is using uh, resonance sensors uh, that are, in, in our cases, mostly AMO-based to do tests of fundamental physics at, at, at low energy scale. And so in particular, I'll talk about one experiment that uses a high quality mechanical resonance, namely in the form of optically trapped nanoparticles, to do tests of gravitational physics. And then I will discuss another experiment that's just starting to be developed now, where we use a high quality spin res magnetic resonance, where we're using laser polarized gases to search for short range spin dependent forces, in particular targeting the uh, QCD axion as something that we're hoping to either discover or rule out. So for the first part, um, so if you look at the strength of interactions in the standard model, for example, two protons inside the nucleus, there's this huge disparity of the strength of the most of the standard model of forces with that of gravity. And so this uh, leads our theorists, friends, to uh, encounter this uh, hierarchy problem, which is namely why gravity is so small compared to the other forces in nature, or said another way, there apparently is this huge desert between the energy scale of uh, Electroweak physics, which may be at sort of the TEV scale, and then the energy scale of quantum gravity, which is at the Planck scale, uh, some 16 uh, orders of magnitude above that. And so this leads to a, a theoretical conundrum of naturalness or uh, fine tuning, where one has to insert a parameter in the Lagrangian and tune it at the 30 second decimal point in order to get a physical value for the Higgs mass. So this has led theorists to suggest some solutions to this puzzle, the most popular of which is supersymmetry, which is currently being looked for at the LHC. Other ideas have been that there can be large extra dimensions in space, and then this apparent really high scale of quantum gravity might not really be a fundamental scale, but it's it sort of a result of gravity getting diluted as it propagates into these extra spatial dimensions. And so the point is that these kind of effects might cause gravity to be different below some characteristic length scale, which is typically the Compton wavelength of some new particle that's getting uh, exchanged. And that length scale can be at the submillimeter level. And so we're looking basically for the one over our gravitational potential to, to start deviating from its uh, Newtonian form and acquire some new uh, exponential. So in particular, if I look at two masses uh, separated by some distance, the Newtonian potential will get modified by some additional term here where this alpha is some dimensionless number which just says, okay, this new physics is some certain strength relative to one, the strength of gravity. And then this range here is limited by the interaction length or the Compton wavelength of the particle, which this range can be at the submillimeter scale for both of these two ideas that I uh, mentioned on the previous uh, slides. So I can ask, well, what are the limits on this kind of uh, interaction? We think we know gravity reasonably well, at least at solar system scales, galactic scales, and so forth. And so, so I can look at the limits on deviations from this one over our Newtonian potential as a function of length scale. Now going all the way up to 10 to the 14 meters here and down to uh, <coughs> millimeter here on the, on the left side. And there's really tight constraints, for example, from things like lunar laser ranging, where we know this uh, one over our potential is good, at least at the part in 10 of the 10 level. But if you look, you know, now way on the left here, when we get to laboratory scales, millimeter scales and below, this, this curve steeply is rising. And we quickly enter the regime where this alpha exponent here switches from negative to positive, where there could be there could be interactions here that are much stronger than one, and, and they would not be ruled out by experimental tests. And so the reason uh, lab experiments are hard here is if, if we just look at how the gravitational force scales if I have two objects. So if I have two spheres and I bring them together as close as possible at, at twice the radius separation, I can figure out that the Newtonian force between the spheres basically scales like the positive uh, fourth, sorry, this pointer is kind of dying here the positive fourth power of the, uh, of the size of the object. And so if I plug in densities here for as dense objects as I can find on Earth, then the Newtonian force, uh, uh, at, for example, at, at a length scale of around 10 microns, gets to be an enormously small number here, 10 to the minus 21 newtons or the uh, at the uh, zepto-newton uh, level. 
And so to give people a sense of scale who don't do force measurements on a daily basis, so this is sort of like saying I have a person standing on a bathroom scale, and maybe they, you know, they weigh 70 kilograms or something, so they exert a force of a few hundred newtons on the scale. If my spring was really precise, maybe I could tell the difference between you know, 700 and 700.1, for example. But if I wanted to you know, measure if a dust mite landed on their shoulder, I would need accuracy at 10 to the minus 7 level. Or, for example, if a virus landed, I'd need 10 to the minus 19. Or an extra individual carbon atom, I would need sensitivity at 10 to the minus 25 newtons. So the, the, the force here is somewhere between being able to detect that, that extra virus or carbon atom standing on a person. And so as another point of reference, the uh, atomic force microscope, which is commonly used in condensed matter physics, measures typical force on the, on the level of 10 to the minus 11 newtons. So we're talking about 10 billion times smaller uh, sensitivity here for this kind of effect. OK, so one technique that people can use to look for these kind of forces is uh, resonant force detection. And here's a prototypical example of a resonant force sector that I particularly like, the, the cantilever beam. It's basically a diving board. You have some, uh, you apply some force to the tip, you get some displacement, you measure the displacement, and you can infer something about the force that, that's applied to it. You can take advantage of the natural resonance response of this, just like a mass in a spring. So if I have a sinusoidal driving force and I excite it on the resonance, then I get an enhancement of the amplitude by the mechanical quality factor of the system which can be quite large if there's very low mechanical dissipation, you know, over 10 to the 5 or, or even higher. And so this gives me a nice handle where a small, tiny force can get transduced into a large amplitude that I have some hope of being able to detect. And so um, if I ask, well, what, how small of a force can I really see? I mean, so one of the fundamental limitations in these kind of measurements comes from just thermal Brownian motion, right? So this cantilever beam or mass and spring or whatever is in contact with some thermal bath just hits at some finite temperature. And if I just write down the equipartition theorem and analyze, you know, what is the smallest force I can detect in the presence of these random thermal vibrations, I can derive this formula, which is basically that this minimum force I can see goes like the thermal energy, uh, kT, times the uh, spring constant times my measurement bandwidth uh, divided by the mechanical frequency and then this mechanical quality factor all to the one-half power. So I can look at, how, look at some numbers here for some uh, devices. So here's a uh, silicon cantilever beam that's uh, 250 microns long, a third of a micron th uh, thick. And in a cryogenic uh, environment, we can get sensitivities of these kind of devices that, that are on the level of 10 uh, attonewtons uh, per square root of hertz in a uh, cryogenic system with a quality factor of around 10 to the 5. So using these kind of devices, I took part in an experiment uh, during my PhD where we uh, used this type of cantilever sensor. We put a mass on the end of it, and then we uh, had another mass nearby that we oscillated back and forth to look for these corrections to short distance gravity. So here there's, there's this patterned material with, with different density of material in it sitting on a motion actuator. This, this vibrates back and forth and modulates the force on that, on that test mass, which is on the cantilever beam. And then in between the two, we have a a screening membrane which we uh, use to uh, block uh, electromagnetic and other kinds of background signals in the experiment. And so using this, we were able to put some bounds on these uh, con uh, corrections in the Tony potential at sort of around the 10 micron length scale um, back in 2008. So here's the, again, a plot of this parameter space now for this corrections to this Newtonian potential but now at a much lower length scale. So now going down uh, way to the left from the previous plot, so this is at 100 microns down here to uh, 10 nanometers. And now this is this, on the vertical axis is this strength parameter here for this new physics relative to gravity. Notice the exponent's now positive from one times gravity here all the way up to 10 to the 15 times gravity down there. And so the ex region, the shaded area here has uh, been excluded by experiment. Uh, so the work I described on the previous slide is, is uh, setting limits around this 10 micron or so length scale. There's some really nice experiments at the University of Washington involving precision torsion balances, which have the best constraints uh, kind of at a little bit larger length scales. And uh, at shorter distance, there have been measurements of the Casimir effect, which have put constraints on this plot. Uh, Alex Sushkov is here in the audience, I think, contributed to one of these uh, measurements. So I can ask, well, if I want to start to dig further into this parameter space, um, in particular on the, on the shorter length scale of this uh, plot, I need to, one thing I need to do is improve my, my just sensitivity. And so 
I can ask how can I try to improve this fundamental limit from, from thermal noise. And so if I look at the scaling of this formula, we can make the you know, device smaller, we could lower the temperature in the numerator here, or we could raise this mechanical quality factor. And so what we can do with um, AMO techniques is work on this, this last idea where you raise the quality factor. And so basically, the, the mechanical dissipation in this cantilever beam is you know, due to things like surface imperfections and the clamping mechanism, and then also you know, thermal elastic dissipation in the material as it moves. And so if you basically remove this uh, you know, mass spring system here from being this cantilever and instead look at an optically levitated particle. So here we have a, a particle that I can levitate inside of an optical field just using the optical dipole force. Now here I could measure the motion of the center of mass of that particle, and it again looks like a mass on a spring. But the key thing here is that now we've decoupled the center of mass motion from the environment. And so there's no more clamping mechanism. I don't, I'm not concerned anymore about these other lossy mechanisms with you know, surface imperfections and so forth in the material. And so this allows me to get much higher uh, mechanical Q factor. So if, I, if I'm in the regime where I to go all the way to the ultra-high vacuum limit and I have uh, pressure-limited damping, I can get mechanical quality factors in the system that are really you know, quite uh, large, approaching even uh, 10 to the 12 or something like that. And so, so this is for a 300 nanometer uh, silica bead like the kind we use in our experiments. So if I plug in the, the sensitivity into this formula now, we can see now our sensitivity is at the level of 10 to the minus 21 uh, newtons uh, per root hertz, which is uh, some orders of magnitude uh, more sensitive than some of the other uh, state-of-the-art so, so, um, state solid-state uh, kind of force sensors. Now, it isn't quite that simple. Uh, in this system, we have to also do some uh, optical cooling. So if we optically trap one of these particles in a laser, uh, we can get trapping frequencies that are, say, on the order of you know, 100 kilohertz or so. And if I have a quality factor that's really at the you know, trillion level, then if I have an oscillation of this particle in that potential, it'll take about 10 to the 7 seconds for any perturbation on the particle to ring down, which is not very practical for measurement timescales in the lab where you like to do things on a reasonable timescale of graduate students. And so <clears throat> we also need to worry about more fundamental limitations where we have heating mechanisms or in this laser trap, we have Raleigh scattering of the photons that are forming the trap, and eventually the center mass motion will get heated by that Raleigh scattering and lead to a heating mechanism that would kick the particle out of the trap. So we actually have to use some kind of cooling and, and damping mechanism, and so we can do that in a couple of ways. One is sort of actively doing it by measuring the position of the particle and, and applying a force on the particle proportional to its velocity. Uh, one can also do a passive scheme where you, one takes advantage of the resonance and optical cavity to provide cooling. That's described uh, nicely in this paper. I don't have time to uh, go into the details of how that works in this talk. So <clears throat> I can ask, okay, well, now I'm, I'm, I had this really high Q thing, and I'm telling you I can't work with the high Q. What happens to my sensitivity when I, when I damp the, the quality factor? And so it turns out... So if I, if I take this oscillator and I reduce its temperature and its quality factor, then for the kinds of cooling schemes I just described, you tend to actually reduce the quality factor and also the temperature by essentially nearly the same factor. And so now then the ratio here, uh, which I know is my sensitivity, gets preserved. So I get to keep the same sensitivity I would have had with this ultra-high Q in the absence of the cooling, but still work with a much more practical lower Q and just a colder system. So there are some corrections to this where you have to worry about additional heating mechanisms. This is the term here for the, from this Raleigh scattering uh, from photon recoil, which I mentioned. That was actually experimentally seen just earlier this year, and, and the level of that was uh, recently confirmed by this work uh, in uh, Switzerland. So I can ask, okay, here's a graph of the sensitivity as a function of the size of the particle. So generally, if I look at spheres ranging from you know, 50 nanometers up to, say, a, a few microns, the force sensitivity uh, gets better as the particle size gets smaller. Uh, I can also plot the acceleration sensitivity. So here we're forces at the 10 to the minus 21 newtons uh, per root hertz level. Acceleration's pushing below the micro G per root hertz level. And the deviations you see here where these lines start to curve and, and no longer follow these straight lines have to do with that, uh, that Raleigh scattering uh, photon recoil I mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, so using this, we want to do a, a micron scale test of the, uh, one of our gravitational potential. So our experiment schematically looks like this. We have a 300 nanometer diameter silica particle uh, 
trapped near a mirror, which is one of the mirrors of an optical cavity. So it's trapped at a point where the light intensity is the maximum at an antinode of a standing wave field inside that cavity. Behind the mirror of the cavity, which is a thin membrane, we have a device which is a pattern of different densities. It's on a movable uh, actuator device that oscillates this mass up and down perpendicular to the direction of the particle. When that happens, then the density that's closest to the, the uh, particle gets modulated and the gravitational force on the particle consequently gets modulated. And so we project that, you know, with the improved sensitivity and the precise localization near the surface that's possible using this optical confinement, we can get something like on the order of a million times uh, better uh, sensitivity on this parameter space at the sort of the micron length scale. The two projections here are for two different size particles, uh, so 300 nanometers uh, diameter for the first and, and three microns for the second. Okay, so here's the experimental setup. So we have a, a, lot, a few sets of lasers in the experiment. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. I guess, uh, oh great, okay, so, so um, here, here is the uh, experiment. Uh, where um, we have the optical cavity axis here. This is, this is along the direction here. We have additional uh, optical dipole trap that we use to initially trap the particle in, in uh, vacuum. And then we have a set of three uh, feedback laser cooling beams which we use to, to optically cool the motion of the particle. This is the schematic of the overall setup. And so we start off by collecting one of these particles uh, at, at a pressure of a, a couple tor that's kind of an intermediate vacuum in a, in a standing wave trap that's formed by these counter-propagating um, beams. So the polarization of these two beams is primarily orthogonal. We, we admit a little bit of uh, the opposite polarization through, the, through one of the counter-propagating beams to give a little bit of interference here. And so we create essentially what is a weak or, or shallow optical lattice potential along the length of this uh, trap here where we have a set of sites where we can trap one of these particles. And so here is a, a plot showing that we can have a particle in one site and by applying an additional laser perturbation on we can make it hop by one, by one lattice site in this potential. So once the particle's in the potential, then we have to do some uh, laser cooling on it. So for the reasons I mentioned before, so basically we image the uh, motion, the scattered light from the particle onto a segmented quadrant photodetector we take that signal and then we phase shift it to get something that's proportional to the velocity of the particle and feed that back to some acousto-optic modulators to put forces on the thing to, to cool it down. And so um, it's, it's, it's a little, uh, so that, then that, that's happening in three directions there as shown. So it's a little bit trickier to actually get this to work in practice when you, when you first collect the particle at a few tor. Um, our group and other groups uh, found that there were some trapping instabilities where people tended to lose the particle if you try to go from this intermediate vacuum regime to the really high vacuum regime where you have these really high Qs and excellent sensitivity. And so this is just a graph showing as we pump the, pump the air out of the system, um, we would lose the particle at kind of below the tor level. And this was a little bit surprising since if you calculate the trapping depth in this kind of system, it's something like over a million degrees. And so um, without th this is so this is occurring without this this feedback cooling mechanism. So we tried to understand a little bit about what's going on there, and we think one of the main uh, effects that one is worrying about is the so-called radiometric forces or photothermal forces. So this is a nice uh, toy that you can buy now in a in a in a shop. But but this is similar to an experiment done by Crookes uh, in previous centuries, where where Crookes had thought that he had discovered uh, radiation pressure. And so what he has here is a system where most of the air is evacuated, but not quite all of it. Inside here you have these veins that spin. One of the, one of the sides is highly reflective. The other side is highly absorptive. And so if, if radiation pressure was the dominant force here, you'd expect it to spin in the direction where it pushes harder on the reflecting side. But as you can see, it's actually spinning the opposite direction here. And what's going on is that you're actually heating the gas, it, the residual amount of gas that's in there, and creating a current of the gas that pushes it the wrong way. So this is nice, clear evidence that these radiometric forces or gas-driven heating forces can easily dominate the radiation pressure force, which is giving us our optical trap. And so this becomes important when the mean free path of the, of the, of the uh, gas is about the same size as the particle. So for our system, you can calculate this, this is the photothermal force uh, as a function of pressure here. So there's some range over which that photothermal force is fairly constant 
from you know 100 torr down to down to the sort of 10 millitor range. So while this force is constant as we remove the gas from the system, the damping rate of the system is decreasing. While this force is not decreasing, so what we see is that the center mass temperature of the system eventually rises up to the point where this heating rate is uh, overcoming the gas damping rate, and then the particle gets gets kicked out. And so at that point, yeah. So the trap wasn't an optical dipole trap. Yeah, that's right. It's an optical dipole trap. That's not the Right. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's it's some manifestation of it's from the refraction of light, if you like, in that case. Right. But but so the point is just that the, the you know it's the, the that this gas-driven dynamics can can exceed the the forces from from the radiation, whether it's uh, whether it's from the dark shift or the yeah. It's a big particle. It's a very big part. That's right. Yeah. So so what this shows then is that once we once we apply optical feedback at a sufficient level, we can um, pump the particle down to high vacuum. At that point, we can decrease the amount of feedback by over an order of magnitude and still keep the particle in the trap. And so this really shows that the gas is having some, playing some role in the loss mechanism in this kind of intermediate pressure range. So once you do that, you can keep the particle in, in ultra high, high vacuum or high vacuum at least. And so, so here is some now force sensing data with the, with the, the system. So here, um, now I'm showing the force as a function of averaging time. And so we start off with a sensitivity uh, at around an attonewton per root hertz. This is limited mainly by uh, technical noise. We think uh, fundamentally we could be about a factor of 10, better than that. We can average for a long time and show that our system is actually fairly quiet. So we can average down to levels of this zepta newton or 10 to the minus 21 newton force uh, range, which is starting to be useful now for these gravitational kind of experiments. This is the spectral density showing the cooling that we apply to the system. And so when you, when you measure a force that's this small, it's, and you're searching for some new hypothetical interaction, it's nice if you have some kind of calibration or way of checking that you would have actually seen a force at that level if it was really there. And so we do that using a couple of ways. One is with an electrostatic method. So um, it turns out about 90% of the time these particles have zero charge on them, and they tend to stay that way. But occasionally we get a particle that has one or two electrons. When, it, when we do, we can apply an electric field that we know using a set of electrodes in the optical cavity. And then we can, using this known force, compare our inferred uh, force in the system with the measured force as a way of checking the sensitivity. And then also we can use another method of calibration on a neutral particle where we use this optical lattice spacing as a ruler. You take a particle, you put it in one well, you kick it to the next well with a laser, and now you have a ruler here, which is basically the half wavelength, wavelength of the light that you can use to calibrate to make sure you're displacing, you're sensing the displacement you think you are. Okay, so at the moment we're, uh, working on transitioning the particle into the optical cavity trap and getting it close to the mirror. So that, that's the, currently uh, what's happening. We, we, we have this uh, cavity to give you both precise localization and also the cavity gives you enhanced position readout, which we think will ultimately improve our sensitivity, uh, where we are hoping within the next uh, you know, six months to a year start to get some measurements close to the surface. Here are some of the MEMS uh, uh, masses that we fabricated that, that are moving up and down behind the mirror. And here's just a photo of one of the devices where this, this is an actuator stage system, which is uh, basically allowing that mass to move behind the mirror where, where the particle's on the other side. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and transition at this point to my, ne my next topic. I have maybe 10 minutes or so remaining. Or OK, so oh, I, I just wanted to briefly mention you could also use these really high force sensitivity in these systems to do gravitational wave detection at the higher frequency end of the spectrum. So, um, so for example, using a, a cavity where you trap one of these particles that's much shorter than LIGO, say 10 to 100 meter scale, you could, you could potentially beat the sensitivity of advanced LIGO at high frequency using a much more compact device where you can sort of think about you know, transforming LIGO's precision position measurement into a force measurement. So this is kind of like a Weber bar, kind of like, I guess, what Keith was showing there, except now it's an optical trap instead of a superfluid helium emulating this, this piece of aluminum. OK, so in the last time, I, I wanted to make sure to at least uh, discuss something about this new experiment that just recently got some funding from the NSF that we're uh, developing. So this is a NMR-based experiment to search for the QCD axion. It's got it's collaborators from our institution, uh, Stanford, um, Indiana University, the uh, Center for, Ast or for Axion Physics in Korea and the uh, Perimeter Institute. And so axions, we've heard only a little bit about, I think, so far at this workshop. We're going to hear more in the following uh, talks, are, are generally light's 
particles that are around quite generically in a lot of theories, the most famous of which is the QCD axion, which was postulated in the 70s to solve the strong CP problem or why the neutron EDM is so small. It's also an excellent dark matter candidate in that its mass naturally can fall in a range that explains the abundance of dark matter. There are a number of experiments uh, of working on looking for this sort of uh, uh, physics of so the ADMX experiment, the CAST experiment. We're going to hear about CASPER, which is a nice experiment uh, shortly. So these experiments are looking for the interaction of the dark matter uh, field with, um, uh, with, with some detector, but we'd like to look for the axion from a little bit different angle. And so what we want to do is search for the axion as it might mediate a new uh, fifth force or a spin-dependent force between two objects when I bring them close together at, at short distance. And this allows me to, to source the axion locally in the lab. So I can produce the axion in the lab, detect the axion in the lab, which allows me to, to control the, the measurement in, in ways that wouldn't otherwise be possible. So if I look at the allowed parameter space for the QCD axion, it's generally characterized in terms of the mass of the axion, which is connected to this its decay constant here. And so the, uh, the, there's a bound here where we know axions can't be heavier than about, say, 10 milli electron volts due to bounds from astrophysics, things like white dwarf cooling and so forth, supernova 1987A. Um, if the axion is, is uh, too light, then there could be the overproduction of cold dark matter, uh, which would overclose the universe. This is somewhat dependent on the model, the cosmological model of inflation and so forth. Uh, but then there's this sort of this traditionally allowed axion window between kind of this 10 to the, or this, this micro EV scale up to tens of, 10, 10 milli EV scale, where there's uh, the ADMX experiment is kind of probing the lower energy, uh, at lower, lower mass range in that range, but there's really no existing experiments probing the upper end of that sort of traditionally allowed axion window, and that's where we want to try to target with this experiment. And so the way we'll do that is looking for, this is similar to my previous slide where we looked at the you know, scalar new forces between objects. Here we're looking for a similar thing, except spin-dependent forces. So if I have some, the mat, if I, I have two nuclei that I bring together, for example, at close distance, I can get some interaction between the spin of one nucleus and the mass of another. And so this potential here has some exponential suppression according to now the Compton wavelength of the axion, which sets the interaction range because it couples to the sigma, the, the spin, I can think about it like a fictitious or an effective magnetic field. It's not a real magnetic field, but it, it looks like one because it couples directly to this fermion spin. And so because it's not an ordinary magnetic field, it, it doesn't obey Maxwell's equations. And crucially for this experiment, it can be screened using magnetic shielding. Uh, it cannot be screened using magnetic shielding, whereas ordinary magnetic noise uh, can, be, can be screened with magnetic shielding. So we're going to try to search for this tiny fictitious magnetic field. Now, so there have been some experiments along, somewhat along these lines in the past where one attempts to use NMR to detect these kind of effects. So, so if I have, for example, some fermion that I bring by a, a, a nucleus, for example, take a spin one-half uh, helium-3 nucleus, in a magnetic field I get some energy splitting between spin up and spin down, and the spin, nuclear spin will process at the nuclear spin Larmor frequency. And now if I bring this mass nearby, I change the effective magnetic field because of this fictitious magnetic field, then the, the Larmor frequency actually would get modified as a result of this proximity of this mass. And so there are some constraints from precision magnetometry on these spin-dependent forces. This is a graph showing the product of the coupling constants of that, uh, uh, that equation I had in the previous slide versus the, either the force range or equivalently the mass of the axion in, in EV here. And so these precision magnetometry experiments have bounded this shaded light blue area here. Um, if you combine that work with astrophysical limits, then one can be a little more aggressive and take out a couple more orders of magnitude of that parameter space. But if I ask, okay, well, what do I really expect from the QCD axion in terms of this coupling? Then I get this band here, which I've shaded as gray here at the bottom, right? And so, so there's a band here because there's an upper bound on how big this can be from the current limits on the neutron EDM which basically forced theta QCD, this parameter in the standard model, to be below about 10 to the minus 10. But we also know there is some amount of CP violation in the standard model, and so I can put an, a lower bound on theta QCD at, the, at around 10 to the minus 16. And so this is what gives us this, this range here of a couple, six orders of magnitude of where the QCD actually might live. But the point is that all of the work, even including the astrophysics, is now many orders of magnitude from being able to access that axion space. Okay, so we have an idea. This is for a new, different kind of technique also based on NMR, but we're now going to use some resonant enhancement. Where I'm going to, again, have a spin 
one half helium-3 nucleus in an external field. I have some Larmor frequency and energy splitting here. But, okay, so why can't I? Okay. So then, but I wanna, what I want to do here is now exploit a resonant technique where I'm going to move the mass closer and farther from the spin at the nuclear Larmor resonance frequency. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this fictitious magnetic field as the H1 field or the transverse field in NMR. Okay, five minute things. And then that's going to cause the spin to process and uh, cause there to be a transverse magnetization, which gets resonantly enhanced by the effective quality factor here, which is the frequency times the T2 time, which can be quite large. And then so then we can detect that processing magnetization with a squid magnetometer. So here's more schematically what the real setup looks like. So we have a uh, laser polarized uh, helium-3 gas in an enclosure. Uh, we have a, a squid pickup loop to measure the, um, fabricated by the Korean collaborators to, to, to measure the processing magnetization. And then the, the, uh, this is sitting inside a superconducting shielded uh, block, a niobium coated quartz block to block ordinary magnetic fields where the fictitious axion magnetic field is, or effective magnetic field is sourced by this rotating cylinder. So this, this rotating cylinder has teeth in it, and as the teeth spin by, the teeth uh, pass by the uh, polarized helium, again, at its nuclear alarm or resonance frequency, which then coherently drives the precession of those nuclear spins that can get picked up then with the uh, magnetometer. So the fundamental limit here is from the uh, transverse, just quantum spin projection noise, which is gonna go like one over the square root of the product of the volume density and T2 time of that, of the helium three. Okay, so I have to go a little quick. I'm running out of time. So here's the apparatus at Indiana that we're using to polarize the helium. Here's a, a schematic of the cryostat, uh, guts of the cryostat. We have a rotation stage. Uh, we have a, the rotating source mass and three of these sensors positioned around it so that we can do correlation between the things, we have a separation of a couple hundred microns between this enclosure where the helium is and, and where the spinning mass is. And um, so I can ask what sensitivity can I expect? So this is, depending on the T2, ranging between one second or a thousand seconds, I should now be able to start cutting into this QCD axion parameter space with the preliminary setup geometry that we're, that we're um, working on. We think uh, eventually, if you really optimize the scaling, we can get something more like this aggressive curve here, which is this projected reach line, the darker blue. And if I ask what, what is the fundamental limit from the squid magnetometer itself for that reason to read things out, that would be down here at this dashed line. So there's, we think we can use, assuming this you know, works, we can, we can start to now cut into the space here for the QCD axion. Now there's a number of experimental channels but I'm not gonna have a whole lot of time to discuss since I'm already running a minute or two past. I just want to give you the flavor of some of the things we're worried about, one of which is magnetic gradients where we need to have, you know, we have to worry about inhomogeneous broadening. We want to have the entire sample excited on resonance. We have some techniques to, to, to try to mitigate some of, the, some of the issues there. We worry about vibrations, things like the patch effect, flux noise, trap flux in the shield, uh, Johnson noise, uh, the Barnett effect, which is basically the magnetization of an object upon its rotation. It's the opposite of the Einstein de Haas effect, if you're familiar with that. We worry about magnetic impurities and so forth. And I was gonna say a little bit about our gradient, magnetic gradient uh, mitigation technique, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip over that just based on the time. So just to, to wrap up, um, so I've told you about two different ways where we're trying to use resonant sensors uh, involving AMO techniques for precision measurement. First with uh, force sensing, to try to put bounds on gravitation and also with magnetic field sensing where we're hoping to uh, get down to the regime where we can look for the QCD axon in a window where there's really no other experiment that's uh, looking for it. And in that way, it's really complementary to the other um, uh, existing axion experiments. We don't need to scan over the mass. And since we produce the axion in the lab, we don't need to assume anything about what it, whether this 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter of dark matter density is really present in our lab. And at the moment, we're working on testing some of the key components. And uh, with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. And, sorry, the, the most important slide, thanking the people that actually do the work and, the, and our funding. So, thank you very much, um, because you kind of were so conscientious, conscientious with your time. There is time for a few questions. So Good. if you want to know something about this kind of skip So why, why don't you why don't you take the chance and tell us about
Jim. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I'll go relatively quickly. So the issue here is that we want to we're doing a really precise magnetometry experiment. We're trying to measure magnetic field, effective magnetic field at the 10 to the minus 19 tesla. And so that might sound crazy, except that we need we think it's possible if we use superconducting shielding. And so we need to use a superconductor because it's essential to avoid Johnson noise. So, so ordinary materials have thermal currents in the electrons that cause a magnetic field spectrum near materials. But if I have a superconductor, I have a way around that. And so the superconducting shield works through the Meissner effect, which basically excludes uh, flux from crossing the superconducting boundary. And so you can think about that, modeling that as using the method of images. Where imagine here I have a chamber where I'm going to have my uh, helium-3 sample. I've got this superconducting shielding wall right next to it. And on, on the other side, one can think about an image dipole of that superconducting, uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, image dipole of that, of that helium-3. And so this leads to a problem because I have unwanted images, essentially. So I want a constant, so I, I use a, a spheroidal shape for the container where the helium is. The reason of that, you probably remember from Jackson, if you take a, a, uh, a sphere that's uniformly magnetized, the magnetic field is constant inside. It turns out you can deform that into a spheroid and still keep it constant inside. But now I have this magnetic shield, which is right next to it. So this image currents in the shield make it look like there's an image spheroid on the other side of the shield, which exterior to it produces fields which are not constant. And so now I introduce gradients in my, in my thing. And so, so to account for that, I can use a compensation coil where I consider a coil and its image to flatten the field. And then, and then I also need to control the Larmor frequency in here so that it matches the spinning frequency of that mechanical device. And so I need to put a constant field. So the normally way we do that is with a Helmholtz coil but you can't really put a Helmholtz coil when the system is up against the superconducting boundary. So what we do is a geometry that we call the D-coil. We basically run, the, run a D-shaped coil here. So if I look at it from the top, there's an image current, which when added to the original current, makes it look like you have basically a Helmholtz coil right up against the wall. And so this allows me to put a constant value to tune sort of the, the constant field, and then our compensation coil allows us to flatten the field. And we think, so we, using simulation, we, we can flatten it by about a factor of 100 which we think will give us T2s that are on kind of the 100 second time scale. So I can answer more about that if there's okay. questions. Uh, but maybe I've used no, up all my time. So, yeah, so. So. Oh, so I had a question on the, um, you know, the detection of the helium spin polarization. Have, have you thought about, you know, so like in some of our experiments, like we detect the helium spin polarization by putting some alkali atoms inside there and looking, you know, optically because of the spin exchange collision. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I mean, is that something yeah, no, it's, Fair, it's, it's it, that would be a possibility. I mean, so in this case, we're just, since we're already cold, we need yeah. the superconductor. We figured the squid magnetometer yeah. is kind of the workhorse already in that environment. But you could, in principle, try to do some other kind of magnetometer to measure the processing spin. So we're, we're actually not doing the, the, the spin exchange optical pumping, so we're not going to have any alkalis for the, yeah. we're going to use metastability exchange, which I skipped over. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Right. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair question. So if I look back at my plot here for a second, um, uh, yeah, so, so here, if we were to eventually be able to push this all the way down here, then we could make an argument that we've essentially ruled out the axion, which I think would be interesting, because then you'd have some other mechanism that explains the strong CP problem. But so, you know, whether we're at the verge here of seeing something in this first decade is, is not obvious, right? So, um, but, but I think, you know, it's certainly within the, within the plausible space for, for uh, discovering where, where the axon might live. So, so there's sort of a complementary between, complementarity between our work and, say, like the independent measurements of the neutrine EDM, right? So, so um, if, if the neutrine EDM is measured, they basically would collapse this band into a line. And then we could, in principle, measure the, um, uh, by, by figuring out the range, measure the mass, essentially, of the, of the axion, if, if it was, in fact, the axion that was producing that. So I, I would like to find it so. <laughs>
Oh, sorry. We're already kind of cutting into Alex's time. So. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, though. Okay.